Welcome everyone to today's webinar. This is Scaling Up Your Community or Faith-Based Initiatives. My name is David Gates and I'm the Director of Online Education here at Grand Station and I'll be your host. Now, as part of the nonprofit community, you likely desire to bring about positive change in your community. But to achieve success, it's vital to use the right planning tools to fully demonstrate the resources you need and the changes you would like to see. Fortunately, we have Michelle Foster with us today to share the secrets behind her successful journey of transforming Alapa Appalachian families through a community-based, faith-based, faith-motivated initiative. Michelle is an engineer, nonprofit leader, philanthropy executive, and a public speaker. And currently, she is the president and CEO of the Greater Kanawha Valley Foundation, the largest community foundation in central Appalachia. And today she's going to share her experience with you to guide you on the path to program planning, evaluation, and sustainability. So please welcome Michelle Foster. Oh, Michelle, you're on mute. So we'll welcome you there. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Take it away. Hi, everyone. It, it is so good to have you here with me today. I'm joining you from uh, Charleston in wild and wonderful West Virginia. I, I think I heard at least one West Virginian on the on the line, so it's good to have you all here. Um, before we get any further down the down the uh, road with this webinar, I wanted to get a feel for what you what you expect. What do you expect to gain from this workshop? What do you expect to gain? Just drop it in the chat. Yeah, so it looks like some people are chiming in there already, Michelle. So Ross says, um, concrete tools for community outreach. Um, Laura says, new insights. Um, looking to scale up a current pro pilot project. Um, and tips on scaling pilot projects as well. Um, Tracy says, insight and knowledge, ideas. Um, Pat is to, wants to hear your story and know that I am not alone. Uh, fresh ideas for initiatives that can work in an impoverished area, um, general strategies, inspiration, um, quite a few different inspiration ones, um, and guidance on scaling. So quite a few different ideas here. Okay, wonderful. Does anyone currently use logic models? Because a big portion of the presentation today, um, I'll be talking about logic models, which, you know, they have been a tool that, the, the best tool that I found in my community work um, has been logic models. So has, has anyone been using logic models to date? Yeah, so it looks like a lot of people, quite a few yeses, but quite a few no's is pretty split. Um, Jocelyn okay. says, we've heard of them. Uh, Robert says, logic what now? So uh, maybe they need some <laughs> updates on those. Um, okay. But I'd say just from that, it looks like pretty 50-50 and a few people um, aren't aware of what a logic model is. So I think it would be oh, a good, good. question for them. Good, good, good. So just a little bit um, about me. Um, I am a, an immigrant. My, my family and I immigrated to Brooklyn, New York when I was 17. So that upper, the flag you see there, the upper left hand um, on your screen, that is the flag of Guyana, which is where I was born. I, when we moved to Brooklyn, I enrolled at the City College of New York and thought I was going to be an engineer. So that for that photo on the lower left there is from my uh, engineering days at BP Research in Cleveland, Ohio. I, you know, through a, a downsizing and um, cut in workforce, I went from BP in Cleveland to um, Union Carbide in, in South Charleston, West Virginia. And that's where I stuck. And it was during that time that I went back to school, got an, a, a master's in engineering management from um, Marshall University Graduate College. And then I started volunteering at a local church. I found a church home, started volunteering and my life changed. So I found my passion through volunteering. And that led to my work in developing a nonprofit called KISRA, Kanawha Institute for Social Research and Action, a community-based nonprofit that I started from zero. It was someone had done the paperwork before I got there. 
but there was zero programming, zero budget. We started operating in the back of the church and grew it into a multi-million dollar impactful nonprofit serving multiple counties in West Virginia and reaching thousands per year. And that work, oh, while I was doing that, I ended up going back to school again and getting a doctorate in community economic development from Southern New Hampshire University. Um, and it was while I was working at Kisra that I came to the attention of the Greater Canal Valley Foundation. And we are a community foundation that funds nonprofits. So I was invited to apply for that position when the, when the, um, the uh, my, my predecessor was retiring. And here I am today, seven plus years in philanthropy with a heart for community development. Um, within the last year, in February of this year, I published my first book where I captured the strategies I've learned over the years to, to, you know, to really inspire others because I, I believe that if I could make an impact the way I did through Kisra and the way I continue to do through the foundation, that anyone can do it. Because I had no background. I just, I just followed my heart, followed my passion, and you know, through the grace of God, made it happen. And some of the fun things I do, I, I have a podcast, Fostering Solutions. You can look it up wherever you get your podcast. And I love to dance. And actually, earlier this year, I took home a mirror ball at our local United Way, Dancing with the Stars. So pretty full life, um, a fun. I continue to serve my community in numerous ways. And um, I'm sharing today on this uh, free webinar to really inspire you. And I thank uh, Grand Station. I thank the leadership there for inviting me to be here with you today. So my object, I'm glad to, to hear that people wanna be inspired. I, I, I'm here to really inspire you to let you know that whatever it is that you're trying to do, it can happen. Because if I was able to do the work that I did in a poor community in West Virginia, Wherever you are, you can also do that. I want to also enlighten you on the tools that I used over the years. This, the main tool would be the logic model to really guide the work and to really make an impact and, you know, educate you along the way about um, nonprofit work, nonprofit program design, and so on. So let's jump right in. A quote that I like about this work is that for every minute spent in organizing, an hour is earned. So don't skip the planning and organizing as you seek to scale up your initiative. Take the time you need to lay out, to plan, because it's gonna help you in the long run. And I've lived that. The reality is, there's always room for improvement. We have the best intentions as, as organizations that are serving marginalized poor communities in our various states around, around the country. We have the best intentions to improve and positively impact those lives, uh, the lives of the people in, in, in our communities, um, whether they are children, their families, their people who have fallen on, on, on some bad luck, may have gotten into trouble with the law, whatever it is, we have the best intentions. And we do so by implementing programs or projects to really uh, try to meet those needs. And, you know, we have varying levels of success as we seek to make a positive impact, but there's always room for improvement. Just some, a few definitions as I go along before I, as I start using these terms. Scale up is about increasing the size or scope of a program. Someone mentioned um, a piloting a program, yep. But for you to go from, we had our first program with the nonprofit I ran was a volunteer after school program. And then one of our largest programs was a, workforce development programs serving non-custodial fathers, serving people who were previously in, in, incarcerated. So it, it takes some time to plan, to design, to think through how the program will flow and to how you will uh, uh, evaluate that program. 
And when I talk about community program, I think I'm thinking of um, programming offerings that are, are ongoing, that are focused on outcomes, and we'll have a definition for those a little later. They're responsive to community needs. So there's a basis for them. There's just, just not random. Oh, I, this, I think this will be cute. Let's try this. It's really based on and grounded on uh, community needs. And they have a greater opportunity for impact. I'm not talking so much about community service projects, which could just be, you know, like a one and done kind of thing. I'm really referring to sustained engagement in, in, uh, in programming. So how can we improve? How can we improve? We can improve, first of all, in getting community buy-in by considering our projects based on real community needs, needs that are understood by everyone involved. We can improve in uh, buying community buy-in by making sure that our communities and our partners are really aware of all elements of the program that we're trying to present. We can improve um, in terms of the partnerships that we are, um, we should be considering and enhancing. And do, as we seek to find partners, can the partners clearly identify opportunities for us to work together? Maybe thinking of like a, a Venn diagram, areas of overlapping interest. Uh, can partners connect the different pieces of our project from what we're putting in, the resources that we need to what we are producing from the work, the outputs and the outcomes? We can improve by efficiently using our resources, by considering whether we're doing things right, whether the inputs and the resources that we're really considering all of them, thinking ahead of time so not we're not running around, oh, we forgot to do this, oh, we didn't do that. You're really sitting down at the onset and considering everything that you need to properly operationalize your project. And we can also improve by ensuring effectiveness in produ producing change. Are we doing the, the right things? Do projects have activities that lead to, to changes in lives? It's not just really documented, oh yeah, we did this and we did that, we did this program and yeah, we can check that box. But are we really experiencing, are we really promoting and our, our efforts resulting in changes in people's lives. Well, I'd like to introduce you to the most, introduce to some and, and reintroduce to many, the logic model. This is the tool that I have used that really made a difference in me scaling up the work we were doing at my nonprofit. And what a logic model is, it's really a graphic graphical depiction of your overall program organizational plan. And it uses common language and the integrated framework that would then, once you design it on the back end, will help you in your program evaluation. So it's just a graphical representation of your program. Oftentimes we get overwhelmed when we have a program that is de described in paragraphs and paragraphs of text. That's good, but also it's nice to lay it out and it could be the engineering me, but laying it out graphically so you'll see how all the pieces connect in a process. So that is what a logic model is. And that is the, the most valuable tool that I found in my nonprofit career. For those of you who are faith-based, I'm a person of faith. Um, I, 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 I walk by faith. I believe that it, it is my, my faith in God who, that, that has really kept me and this, that has really directed my path. So I always look to scripture for guidance. And one scripture that really resonates with me when, you, when I think about planning and visioning um, is Habakkuk 2, verses 2 through 3. 
And it reads, then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run that who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come, it will not tarry. So your vision, the, your logic model is the vision that you have for your program. And it's important for you to lay it out Lay it out clearly so that people who you're working with, your partners, internal partners, external partners, can really get it so that they can run with that vision. So that at the end of it all, the change that you'd like to see in your community will occur. So this scripture always grounds me and inspires me to plan and to vis envision a future that is brighter than the one that we have. The logic model improves community buy-in by um, because they're directly based on an analysis of community challenges. Logic models, they concisely and clearly communicate the major elements of, of your project or program. It identifies appropriate, appropriate partners because you, you cannot do this work alone. Don't even try to do it alone. You need partners, partners who will help you to, to, they would bring different skills, different assets, different inputs to the table. It, the logic model clearly lays out and links projects input and out, activities and outputs and outcomes, thereby making it easier for potential partners to understand what you're trying to do and figure out, oh, wait a minute, I can do that. That's, you know, we share that, that common vision. We, we, we can do that. We've got those assets there to contribute. They can clearly see themselves in your project. The logic model promotes efficient uses of resources. It really forces us to identify what we need to implement the activities that we're trying to implement. It may, as you sit down and think through, well, you know, we need that space. We'll need, a, we'll need an instructor. We'll need classroom supplies. We'll need snacks, whatever it is that you need. By sitting down and focusing on your developing your, 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 the vision for your project, your logic model, you will promote efficient use of resources. It also um, helps projects to attain the changes in lives that we wanna see. We don't just wanna do implement a program just to implement, and implement a program. We wanna be able to see changes in lives. I don't know if that's what I was about. And I, got, I have a feeling that you're probably, you know, of the same year elk where you're really thinking about how, what is the change that I'd like to see in my community? Logic models, really force, force us to focus on outcomes rather than just doing some things and getting and counting some heads and you know counting just outputs. They make it easier to measure changes in lives rather than merely document that we have finished activity A or activity B. Now here are the elements of the logic model. If you haven't already picked it up, here they are. They are inputs. Inputs, they describe what we need to implement our activities. We need it before we can do our activities, implement whatever it is that we're trying to do. We need to have these inputs available, these resources available. Activities then describe the specific actions that we want that we want to take before we they operate um, they they are expected to be completed within the official time frame of the project activities can only be achieved if we have corresponding inputs available so if we're trying to implement an after school program for example some of the inputs could be, we need tutors, we need space, we need supplies. If we don't have space and tutors and supplies, we will not be able to um, operate our after-school program. 
Then there are outputs. These are the, what's produced, the other things that are produced by the project activities. They are expected within the official time frame of the project. And our short-term outcomes could only be achieved if we have those outputs. And outputs are numbers of things. So it could be numbers of people served, numbers of classes held, whatever it is, numbers of things, those are outputs. And then there are outcomes. There are different levels of outcomes. Outcomes can be short-term, where there are changes in level of awareness, changing, changes in knowledge, changing, changes in skills, and changes in availability of resources. Those are all short-term outcomes. Intermediate outcomes, on the, other hand, on, on the other hand, are changes in behavior that leads uh, people and our communities to, to take action. So once you know better, once you learn, once you know better, you increase your knowledge, you can then change your behavior. You can do better. You can move in a different way. And then long-term outcomes are changes in condition. So once you, for example, if you think of a workforce development program, you increase your the knowledge of the and skills of the, of the of the participants, who can then go out and then now that they have more knowledge, they have some skills, they can now become employed, moving from a state of being unemployed to employed, fully employed. And then the long-term condition could then be there that the family is no longer living in poverty. The family could then be, you know, economically self-sufficient, purchasing a new home, whatever it is, a longer term outcome that comes beyond the time frame of the project. Hope that makes sense for you. This is how you basically read. A, a logic model. The first phase, the first segment of the logic model include, includes the resources and outputs and activities, and that's your planned work. The second phase includes your intended results. So that's your outputs, your outcomes, and then ultimately your impact. So certain resources are needed to operate your programs. Those are resource, you know, resources are output, same thing. If you have access to them, then you can use them to accomplish your planned activities, using those resources to accomplish your planned activities. If you accomplish your planned activities, then you will hopefully deliver the amount of product and or service that you intended. So that's where your outputs come into play. If you accomplish your activities to the extent that you intended, then your participants will benefit in certain ways. That's where we get short-term outcomes, and changes in knowledge, access to resources, changes in behavior, changes in condition. And then finally, if these benefits to participants are achieved, then certain changes in organizations, community systems may, may ex be expected to occur. So that's the kind of down the line impact that you intend through your results. So planned work includes you know, inputs and activities, intended results, those are outputs and outcomes and impact. So that's how you read a logic model. There are you know, different ways that they can be designed from left to right or, or bottom to top, but it's all the same, the same elements. How do we, one question I'm sure you're wondering is like, how do we come up with appropriate outcomes, outputs and activities in order to address real community needs? Well, the logic model. A logic model should be rooted in community needs garnered through problem analysis. So that's how we do it. When you, when you are wondering what are, what's, a, what's problem analysis, Michelle? Well, I'm glad you asked. Problem analysis, it begins with a problem statement. And it's really a way of concisely describing the nature 
the causes and the consequences of a condition that will be is undesirable to one or, or, or a condition affecting our community to one that is more, more positive in our community. So it's really, it, it begins with a problem statement. So if we look at this tree, we see the problem could be the, the trunk of the tree. The roots are actually the causes of the problem. And we see the branches and the leaves are the effects of that problem. Right. So, for example, if we kind of think about, oh, there they are a, um, a number of unemployed people in our city. So that's the problem. Right. What could be the call? What, what could be some causes there? Some causes could be. Folks don't have the skills that they need to fill the positions that are open. So that those are those are some causes They may they may not have the skills. They may, they may not have the knowledge. So those would all be causes. And then effects would be, so they, the problem is unemployment. Unemployment is there. The effect then would be that they can't support their families. That would be an example of an effect. The um, families would need government assistance, whatever it is. But those are all the effects of the problem that you're trying to analyze. Now in problem analysis, like I said, the problem statement is essential. And problem statements could be made up of an, an, an undesirable condition affecting members of the, of, of, of the community. It could be an undesirable behavior that leads to, you know, the inability to take action or the lack or inadequacy of, a, of, of the certain desirable behavior, the inadequacy or, or lack of knowledge, skills or awareness that lead to the undesirable behavior or the unavailability or lack of resources required to take action and address the undesirable behavior. So these are all ways that a problem statement can be framed. What's a problem? I'll, I'll put it back to you for, for a few minutes. What's a problem that you're trying to address in your community? Type your answers in the chat and we'll, we'll pick one of these problems to be the basis for our, for our sample logic model. So what, what's a problem that you're trying to address in your community? Type your answers in, in the chat. Yeah, it looks like some answers are coming in there already, Michelle. So um, you said gun violence. Um, Mary says, not enough jobs or housing available. Mm -hmm. um, Melissa says, uh, children displaced by substance abuse. Uh -huh. uh, Ellie's working on youth homelessness. Carl's working on homelessness. Um, Jonathan's working on lead poisoning. Uh, Ricky is working with a high rate of recidivism, lack of affordable housing, uh, decreasing wildlife habitat, lack of affordable housing, lack of affordable housing, um, not enough adequate resources for rescued human trafficking victim. Um, the eradication of DV or IPV, post-secondary success, interfaith understanding, um, incur, oh, that was not one of those, uh, more on mental health treatment, mental health, um, housing for the seriously mentally ill, um, violence, parental involvement, uh, lack of black physicians, foot care for the unhoused people. So a lot of different uh, wow, problems lot. are working there, which is great to see. What uh, amazing, just a lot, a lot of challenges we're facing, a lot of challenges that we're facing. Mm -hmm. So with, with each of those, you can develop a, a logic model to, to, to think through what it would take to, um, to make an impact in your community. In problem analysis, and, and we're, I'm gonna pick one as we go to the um, sample logic model. Elements of problem analysis, the effects of the problem, that is, and that's kind of what those, the branches were on the tree. They come as a direct consequence of the problem. They will occur if we don't address, if, we, if those problems are not addressed. It's a negative condition that a, a problem breeds if we just ignore it. And you know, it, it just, the branches get, bigger and bigger and bigger. 
If the problem is stated as an undesirable, undesirable behavior that leads to inaction, the effect will most likely be a negative condition. So we've got to think about that. Then the causes of the problem, those roots, the roots of the problem, if you kind of bring that tree to, to, to memory again, the, the roots of the, of the problem, it's, those are the reasons why the problem exists. Typically, behavior-based problems have causes that are characterized as either or both the lack of awareness, knowledge or skill. And these are behavior-based problems. Not, not all the problems that um, we're, deal we're gonna deal with are behavior-based problems, clearly. Um, knowledge or skill and or the unavailability of resources. So for example, that you know, I heard post-secondary success. If you think about that, it could be lack of awareness, lack of some uh, of knowledge or skills um, that can lead to um, post-secondary um, failure or, or, or the lack of success once someone graduates from high school. So let's move now to a, a logic model exercise. Um, and I, I, I heard a, a, a lot of the, the challenges that you're working on and a couple that rang uh, through to me that, that could be um, behavior-based, um, could be related to behavior are um, the challenge with recidivism I know that that's an issue that we dealt with at, at, at the nonprofit. Um, and also uh, the post-secondary success, that, that's also another one that, spring, that springs to mind. So let's, um, let's pick recidivism. What kind of, if, if you think about that challenge, what is the, out, what is the, long-term outcome that you that a um, a program that could uh, address recidivism what could be a long-term outcome that you're working towards there and, and just to, just to define recidivism that this is someone's likelihood of returning to prison after being released so let's think about that one what could be a long-term desired outcome for a program that addresses recidivism. Drop it in the chat. Anything in there? Yeah, it's starting to come in. It looks like um, job training, family restoration, um, a healthier or more connected in community and families. Um, community stability, uh, mindset change of formation of rehabilitation, um, or success in community defined by work, family, community engagement. That's um, that's a good one family. right there. Yeah, success I that was in community. Too. So that yeah. that could that would be a great long term outcome. Great. Now, now to get there, what would be a kind of? And we're backing down now the logic model. What would be a an appropriate intermediate outcome, a change in behavior. What would what could that look like? What change in behavior would lead to success in community? Yeah, so we have some like um, accessing gainful employment, getting a job, um, increased employment or wages, volunteering. There you go. Increased employment. Increased wages, absolutely. And then short term, what would be, if you kind of back down there, what would be the short term outcome for that particular logic model? And I think I think some of it would be what was our was probably mentioned in one of the other levels. The short term outcome would be increasing knowledge about finding and keeping a job, for example. I yep, think I heard that. that. Attending job training, yeah, or workforce right, development, yeah. job seeking skills. Exactly. 
And then the activity kind of back down, you can back down and say for in terms of outputs, because we, we go from outputs to the different levels of outcomes. So for outputs would be then the number of, if, so if you have this, this program, this, um, let's just call it a re, a, 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 an offender reentry program, the outputs then would, would be the number of people you intend to serve, the number of uh, workshops, trainings, et cetera, that you intend to, to host. So those would all be outputs. And then the activities then would be the workforce development training. It would be the coaching, the mentoring, all that would go into that um, offender reentry program. Those would all be your activities. Then and when you kind of back down now and think about your inputs, what, and then let me go back to the, the diagram. So what would some of those inputs be? What would some be some inputs that you need to make sure that you achieve the, that long-term outcome that you envision? Anybody, just drop it in the chat. What are some? What are uh, what are some of the things that you've got to make Good sure thing. that you have? teachers and volunteers? Um, Thomas says counselors, curriculum and money, facilities, mentors, partners, partnerships um, within the communities um, with local businesses, funding, um, knowledge of different issues. Yep. Um, collaborators in general. Yeah, so those are all, so that's pretty much what, and I've, you know, I've got templates and all that I, that I, that I use and that I um, have in the appendices of my book that really helps you to lay it all out. So that's essentially what a logic model is. It's really considering all aspects of your program, putting it together so that you're being thoughtful up front. And then later, later down the road, you'll be able to better evaluate your impact, which takes us now to evaluation. And evaluation is simply assessing your program, assessing your results to see if you're being effective, to see if you're making an impact. Because no one wants to just be to, to spend their, their life and energy doing something over and over and not making a difference. So by laying out your logic model, it actually helps you not only in your design, but also in your evaluation. Because you go back now and you consider, well, what was our outcome? Did, you know, are the people that we serve, did the people we serve really experience success in community? Did they increase their knowledge about um, finding and keeping a job and actually, you know, kept their, did they keep their job? Did they find employment? So really laying out your, your logic model helps you then to go back and inquire, did we get all those, those resources that we wanted? Did our, were our partners really on board with us? Did they get it? Did they keep their end of the bargain? Did we get the outputs did, that, that we intended? Did we serve the hundred folks that we intended? You know, have they recidivated or, or are they still in community and are they still being successful? By laying out what we intended at the beginning, it then helps us with our evaluation. Before in, embarking on your evaluation journey, because you know people are often a little overwhelmed by uh, evaluation. I know I was when I was starting out. Here are some key considerations um, before you embark on, on your evaluation. For what purpose is the evaluation being done? Are you trying to learn from it so you can improve your program? But that's hopefully that is the best, you know, the, 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 the key reason why you're doing it. And who are you, who are the audiences for the information from the evaluation? It, you know, who are the stakeholders? Stakeholders could be your participants, it could be your board, it could be your community partners, could be your funders. 
these are all the audiences that could potentially be interested in your evaluation. What kind of information is needed to make the decision you need to make? What information do you need? So you can lay it out at the beginning, not after the program has been going for a year. Where are you gonna get this information? From what sources? Would it be from your training records? Would it be from, uh, for maybe after school program from, from uh, grade report cards, whatever it is? You know, where are you gonna get the information? How can that information be collected in a reasonable fashion? When is it needed? And what resources are available to help you collect? Do you have a partner who's gonna help you collect that information? Effective evaluation and program success rely on the fundamentals of clear stakeholder assumptions. Once everybody's on the same page, it makes it easier. The logic model approach helps create shared understanding of what the program's all about, how it's gonna operate, and what activities are needed to produce the outcomes that you'd like. Evaluation experts agree that the use of the logic model is an effective way to ensure that your program is successful. And I, I lived it, I experienced it, and I recommend it. Using a logic model throughout your program helps to organize and systematize your planning, your management, as well as your evaluation functions. And it really helps you to craft structure and you really design your program for success. And success would mean not only operating successfully, but also sustainability. And sustainability, one resource that I highly recommend for sustainability is the Brown School of Social Work at Washington University in St. Louis. And they say that stre strengthening structures and processes that exist within your program to ensure you can strategically leverage resources to weather the changes and challenges that come your way, that's what's gonna improve your capacity to sustain your efforts. And just remembering that sustain, it's not just about funding. There are several different aspects of sustainability, including these eight, environmental support, partnerships, organizational capacity, evaluation and, and uh, program ad adaptation, communications, strategic planning, as well as funding stability. So I think that is, um, that's enough for today. And we're gonna open it up for questions. I wanna thank you. You'll, you'll receive my contact information and I've got a special offer for you, a discount on my book that has more information about planning, all the strategies that I have found to be effective over the years. And I'll, I'll follow up with you um, to also provide this offer by email where you get a $5 off for book orders from my from my website. The book is available on Amazon and whatnot, but I could only do the um, the discount through my website. So that is it for now. We can open it up for questions. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, that was excellent. So just as a reminder, if you do have any questions, you can hop over to the Q and A section and enter them there. Um, one individual had a question um, about kind of using logic models, and I think within a grant application, asking how do you present a logic model within an online application that might be fill in the blank or with limited character counts? You hopefully they they will allow you to do an attachment. Usually, grant app online grant applications. I know I know with our foundation, we allow attachments, so you you would want to upload it as an attachment. And I've got templates available um, that would show that where you can fill in and um, make it like depending on how vast the project is, it could be it could be a one pager where you lay out all the pieces. But I would recommend an attachment. Okay, excellent. Um, and then there were a couple of questions about how can a logic model apply to a faith motivated or faith based initiative. What kind of initiative is it? Because that's what that's all I did. 
They Excellent. didn't say what kind. Um, do, in terms of your past experience, could you talk a little bit about how you applied it to your past experience? We'll see okay, if they chime in. Yeah. yeah. For example, our faith motivated, our entire organization was faith motivated. Like we had after the programs we had included after school programs, workforce development programs, offender reentry, home ownership, small business, um, and on and on health. Um, so it, it, you, we used it to design our program. So it doesn't faith motivated or not, you can use it with your program design. It's like, it's a, it's your overall program plan. So figuring out where you want to go and then using it to guide your path there. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and what are some of the ways um, you use logic models within the community? There's another question there. What are some that you use within the community? Yeah, or some ways you, you use, use the it, logic models. Use, yeah, the use it with, with the programs that you're implementing. Mm -hmm. For example, let's, you know, the, the example we did was a, um, a the, uh, the offender reentry program. That's a, that was a community-based program that our nonprofit um, uh, designed and operated. So we used it to lay out our activities to, to determine what inputs we need, we needed to determine based on, you know, to, to decide, okay, we're gonna serve 500 people, whatever it was, um, to determine the changes we wanted to see. We wanted to improve their their ability to, to find a job and to keep a job, for example. We wanted to make sure that they were successful in the community. That, that, that Someone mentioned that as an example of what they were trying to do, and that's exactly what we were able to use a logic model to do. We mm -hmm. used a logic model in, a, um, in our after-school program. We wanted to offer a, a quality after-school program, so we looked at what was needed to, you know, to operate that program. It, we needed space, we needed food, we needed tutors and mentors, we needed curriculum. So we sat down and said, okay, this, this is all transportation. Those are all inputs. Then we laid out a, um, a, um, a plan for what we're gonna do with the students. There, there's gonna be a time for homework, a time for enrichment, a time for fun, whatever it was. And then we had outputs in terms of how many we, people we wanted to serve every every year. Then the change we wanted to see in terms of making sure that they are, they had increased reading levels, they, they finished high school on time. Um, they went, we had a, 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 um, a teen component where we took them on college tours so that they can get to college. So you can, you can use a logic model to, to design any kind of programs whether they're, they be um, program, programs with paid staff or volunteer staff, it doesn't matter. You can use it in either way. Okay, that's great. Um, then Jocelyn said, what have you found are the most challenging parts of a logic model or the trip hazards? The trip hazards would be just achieving the longer term outcomes, just having enough resources to follow up beyond the project to see what, what really, um, what were the longer term outcomes for participants. That's often hard to do because of limited resources. It's hard to kind of track people down in the community after they have left the program, you know, phone numbers change, people move. So th that's usually the hardest, That's that's been the hardest part. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Very good question. Very good yeah. question. Yeah. Then um, Donna said, many funders discount faith-based um, programs. Or, or do you have any comments or advice? I don't know. if I, It's not. I think funders are concerned about inclusion. Um, they want to make sure that you're not just serving people, say, in your in your own in your own church, but yet, yet you're really. Um, open to the community at large, because even if, in the early days, we operated out of our church, at our, literally in our church basement. 
but we were open to people from all different walks of life, people who are in church or not, people, you know. So I think funders wanna make sure that you are including the community at large in your programming and not just people in your faith community. So I think that's that's the catch right there. And then now that I'm a funder, that's that's I know that's what it is. Because we yeah. fund programs that are operated like currently we fund programs that are operated by churches. Food pantries, for example, many churches operate food pantries, but we don't have an issue um, funding them because we realize that they're serving the entire community. And they may be the only entity available in the community to do the work that they're doing. Okay, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, then kind of bouncing off of that, I think you just answered that question for Bunny, um, but did you use Houses of Worship as partners to deliver your programs? Yes, Okay. we did that. Yeah, yeah, definitely did that. And we, and we got lots of funding from, you know, from state, federal, local, foundation, whatever we were able to attract it and you can too. Just make yep. sure that you're, you're showing that you're being inclusive of all marginalized people, not just the people in your immediate faith community. Okay, excellent. Um, then Melanie said, you mentioned that you use logic models in low income communities. Um, what sort of ideas do you have for generating resources to be able to successfully carry out a logic model in a community? Really approaching an array of funding sources. And I, I can't really go into a lot of where to find funding in my in my book. So I, I, I recommend you get it, but that's like a whole nother workshop. But we received funding from anyone who would give us from church, like for my nonprofit, we started off with the church supporting the nonprofit directly initially for the, in the early days. Because remember, I I had left my engineering career and really followed my 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 passion to operating the, the nonprofit. So for the first few years, our church actually paid for me to get some kind of a salary. So from um, faith communities, from banks, businesses, private businesses foundations, there are different kinds of community of uh, foundations in the community from community foundations to private, to corporate, to state and federal funding sources. Um, one thing that I learned later on is that, for example, at community foundations, there are donor advised and donor designated funds. So though that's where the donor would recommend directly for you to receive their distributions every year. That is a, a source that is not often known by, by everyone. So really getting on the radar of donors with those kinds of donor directed funding, that's also a great way of um, finding funding for your initiative. And I, I talk more about that in my book. Okay, that's great. Um, then Kizia said, do you have an equity, diversity and inclusion model or plan that you could share? Not a, I have, um, I often do trainings on um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I don't have a plan. I'm try trying to think what I may have. I don't think I have a plan per se. I know I've done various presentations on the topic, but I don't have a, like a logic model kind of plan. No, I don't. Okay. No problem there. Um, and then there were a couple of questions about kind of how to, you know, communicate any faith motivated initiative um, to funders that might not um, immediately support a faith based initiative. Um, do you have any tips on how you would really kind of draw the line or communicate that? Um, and I kind of mentioned that before, really just letting them know that you are serving the wider community, ensuring, and, and funders are also gonna be hesitant to fund a project that where you are proselytizing, where you are, because I'm a person of faith, don't take this the wrong way at all, but when you're offering community-based programs funded by federal and other dollars, 
you can't proselytize. You can't during the time of the program. Clearly people, you know, outside of the program, you may want to invite them to church or whatever, you know, that's usually fine. But if you're using public dollars for the program, you can proselytize. So if you're gonna, but once the program is over, it's up to you if you wanna invite someone to come to church, but their participation in your church cannot be based, cannot, cannot be contingent, their, their participation in the program cannot be contingent upon them attending church. So that's kind of where you have to draw the line. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Great. Um, and then this is just a quick question. Chelsea said, are you a GPA member that mentors anyone? <laughs> I have um, I have lots of mentees. It's it's it can be a little overwhelming. I'd be oh, happy yeah. to answer answer a question here or there. Um, but yeah. Not not formal. You're not a formal um, GPA mentor there, no I'm problem. Um, and then last question, um, how or where do you pursue funding for programs in an in po impoverished community? Like right now I am with a funder. I uh, run the Greater Kanawha Valley Foundation in Charleston, West Virginia. We are a, a community foundation and we grant about usually about 13, 13 million every year to um, to um, nonprofits. So look in your, wherever you are, look for community foundations in your area to um, that would do similar work. So I highly recommend community found. We also got a lot of funding from federal sources, Department of Health and Human Services and several others. And I've mentioned, you know, in my book, I capture a lot of these sources there as well. There are also corporate foundations, you know, the, the power company is going to have a foundation, the, you know, several of the corporate citizens um, in your community, they're going to have foundations as well. Um, there are also private foundations and regional foundations. So there are just lots of different, lots of options there. Visit Grand Station to see our latest online education offerings in the form of live webinars, interactive workshops, and on-demand learning. GrandStation.com, your fast track to funding and online education.